And thanks for joining us for today's webinar on predictive modeling, um, building a culture of analytics. We're going to try to make it clear how easy this can be to do and how you can empower your team to use predictive modeling to build faster and better business decisions. So we're going to talk through what is predictive modeling. Uh, we're going to show some examples of how it can be used, one in fundraising, one in consumer, consumer packaged goods marketing. Talk about who can do it, what some of the lessons learned, types of results. And then we're going to talk about building a culture of analytics, because this is useful stuff if it can be used by a team to actually help shape the strategic and decision-making process. So I'm Doug. Um, my background is you know, quite a number of years doing analytics. Uh, I lead currently a software company in the business intelligence sector, but before that I did a bunch of consulting and strategy work uh, and have a BA in physics and an MBA um, and have talked and been kind of around the industry quite a bit. So I'm bringing a wealth of experience from quite a number of clients over the years. I just want to start. This is a quote from a Gartner report. It's footnote at the bottom, fostering an analytical culture to improve your business intelligence and performance management. They say, and others have reinforced this, that research has shown that organizations with outstanding performance levels are more likely to have an analytics culture. That means tools and also people and behaviors and processes. We'll go into more of that as we go through this. And now more than ever before, executives regard business analytics to be a critical component in competitiveness. So first of all, sort of what is predictive analytics? It's a part of this culture of analytics. And it's using mathematical tools and statistical algorithms to examine and to determine patterns in one set of data in order to predict behavior in another set of data. And it integrates well with in-memory data in-memory data management and data visualization. There's a set of these things that go together, these tools that have become to known as data discovery and analysis tools. So the coming out of that, what do you do with this? Well, first is often questions about, do we have good data? There's, I would argue, there's plenty of good data out, of, out there. Almost every business has enough to get started with. And second, in our observations, it's better to get something simple going now than to create an overly complex model later and we're going to hit this several times because this seems to be one of the bigger hang-ups. You know, kind of a stretch for perfection, but at the end of the day, modeling is determining degrees. And you know, a model is never 100%. And a 60% model now, I would argue, is a lot better than an 80% model in two years. We also firmly believe you don't need to be a stats expert to do this. We'll give you an example. But it does take people with an inquisitive mind and a feel for causality, because you have to be able to intuit the relationships between what's called explanatory factors in a behavior. You'll see that in, in a little bit. We also find that as you're building these models, the two or three working together is a really good idea, because somebody will see something or hypothesize something that somebody won't. So it's really best done in this kind of collaborative, you know, small group setting. The key? is knowing the business and the forces and influences behind it. Because as you're doing these models, there's a bunch of factors. And some of them are actually related to the behavior. And some of them are just coincidental. Or some of them are data that looks like it might be independent, but was actually entered by somebody after the fact. And knowing all of that is, I think, far more valuable to getting a good result than being you know, a stats expert who can run you know, the perfect 190-factor model. So, there's a kind of a roughness and a dirtiness in here, knowing the data. And sort of we conclude that internal staff can turn out great models quicker than what's often used these outside consultants since they know the business better. And not to say there's not value in people who know the modeling better, but a lot of the core success of a model is something simple that can be done relatively quickly and uh, it builds into the data that's there. We really like, you know, this kind of the rule of eight out of 10 is better than two out of two. And we hear a lot that somebody says, you know, we don't want to empower the team to do quick models uh, because they might use the data to make some bad decisions. They may not understand the data. and may be incomplete data. And so what then happens is it goes back to some, some experts and some stats experts or some, you know, uh, internal people who really know the data well, which is a good thing, but they're bottlenecked. They can't answer all the questions with data. So the team ends up, instead of making 10 decisions with data and getting eight of them right, they make two with data and then eight of them with no data at all. And we would argue it's better to make 10 decisions using the data and get eight of them right than be limited to only using the data on two. And this is sort of a, 
a key principle of all of this that goes with empowering the team, creating this culture, and doing simple things quicker. Uh, a modeling process, and we're going to show a couple models in a few minutes. Uh, it starts with selecting what's called a target, and you have to pick something. It could be a number, like I want to forecast revenue. We're going to do one of those. Or it might be a subset, like I want to find my top donors. We're going to do that in a few minutes, and maybe they have characteristics, or they have, or maybe it's your know, people who went to a reunion for a, a higher education uh, institution. You can't forecast a number. That's a group of people. But the target is either a subset that you want to identify, or it's a number you want to forecast, and then you compare it to a base population, which um, in the consumer packaged goods target, where we're going to try to forecast revenue, it's going to be four product sales history over uh, like a three-year period. In a fundraising example, it's going to be a set of high current donors compared to everybody else who was rated uh, over a $25,000 contribution level. So it's important to figure out what behavior you're trying to target, and then who do you want to compare it to. In the case of the fundraising, it wouldn't make sense to compare high individual donors to a population that's a bunch of alumni, and parents and organizations and companies because obviously the high alumni donors have completely different sets of experiences and characteristics than a company or a parent. So in doing this work, you have to think through the target and the base. Then what you next want to do is visually explore. See if you can see patterns in the data. There's a variety of visualization charts. You can do this a bit in Excel, but you just want to look at it and see if you can get an understanding of what might cause this group to be different than the rest of the group. Uh, hypothesize, and this is where the two or three people working together really helps. And then there's a bunch of explanatory fields, which is the actual metrics or fields in the data. We're going to go into this in a minute. But this is really important to think through what do you actually have that can be useful and how do I get it into the model and build the model. And that usually happens pretty quick. There's a bunch of tools. You'll see ours in a few minutes. Iterate. A model output happens. You know, some of it may make sense. Some of it may not fit the test of good hypotheses and, and vetting. Uh, go back and start over and adjust. And so it's a process here of you know, a couple, of two, three, four, five runs through. Then you get it. You have an understanding. And then you can predict and score the rest of the population to see who is most likely to have the behavior of the target. In the case of the fundraising example we're going to show, uh, we're going to find some new potential high-end donors. And in the uh, consumer packaged goods sales example, we're going to find what actually influences sales and what's a reasonable expectation for sales going out uh, the next couple of months based on what's happened uh, right now. And then uh, you, know, you get this list and you take action on it. So explanatory fields. It's really important to hypothesize what makes a difference. And just think through, if it's a high net worth donor, what might influence that? I mean, it could be they have a CEO level job. It could be they have wealth because they live in a high net worth town. It might be they've shown a lot of interest because they've come to a bunch of events and clicked through on newsletters recently, so they're engaged. There's a set of those things that are likely to determine that behavior. It might differentiate somebody uh, from somebody else who doesn't have those characteristics or experiences. And then the other thing is that the factors should be independent, uh, not dependent. Like if we're looking at uh, high-end donors again, you obviously don't want to put in how much they've given, because a model will tell you they've given a lot because they've given a lot, which isn't particularly useful. So you have to sort these through. And um, the model will confirm and refute the hypotheses. And think broadly. I mean, most of us have enough internal data to get going. There's what's called the dark data, which is really, uh, we're talking here more about manufacturers and operating companies where you have machine data, network data. It might be outside social media data. We're going to look at some of this in a little bit. But this is the data that's not currently part of the business systems, but it could have clues. And you might be able to call things out of it to help you understand one behavior versus another. And then there's external data. Um, in higher education, uh, fundraising, uh, example coming, uh, we can often get wealth and disease on communities out of Forbes or whatever and bring that in and link it in. Or you can get outside capacity ratings and bring that in and use it with your internal data. Then there's the next question that comes up, how much data is enough? Uh, we've built models with five factors. And we've got a client that has 190 factors for the same thing. Again, this is the principle of doing something simple quickly versus something more complicated longer. 
uh, use what you have, something's better than nothing, starts simple over time. Well, here's an example of five factors. Again, we're looking at higher education fundraising. A lot of the people on uh, this webinar are from that area. Uh, you could look at the number of volunteer positions held in the past 10 years. We like to bound it. You know, don't go back 40 years or 30 years, but 10 years is certainly a good time. Uh, it could be broken into the number of years they were a class agent in the last five years, the number of years they were a class agent the five years back from that, the number of years, the five years behind that, the reunion chair, and so forth. So a model running on these is obviously going to be more fine-grained and probably more predictive, but it's a lot more work. The five-factor model, if it gets you 60% of the way there quickly, we'd say go with it. And over time, if you find that volunteer positions means a lot, break it down into more factors. So uh, where do you get the data from? Uh, you know, a lot of it you have. Um, we've got a manufacturing firm we're working with right now that's got a ton of machine data sitting there in Postgres databases on their machines. We can bring that in and integrate it with the revenue and the customer data. It's, it's hugely valuable. You know, a lot of our fundraising clients have activities and newsletter click-throughs. Uh, that's all kind of data about opt-in engagement that's just sitting there. Grab it and use it. If you're not collecting at start, um, like if it's activity, uh, information, and participation, if you start collecting it now, that usually has a shelf life of a few years uh, from a predictive standpoint. You know, again, if you went to a dinner 20 years ago, it doesn't matter. So if you start collecting it in a couple years, you have a rich database. And outside sources, uh, as we talked, can be useful as well. So now we're going to jump in and look at two case studies. We're actually going to build a model and show how you'd use it, uh, finding top prospects for a fundraiser, and then understanding influences on revenue in a consumer packaged goods company. So uh, first, the top prospects. Here what we're going to do is look at a set of data, and the target's going to be the people who have given a million dollars or more. And the base population is going to be everybody who has uh, been rated at a $25,000 level or up. Um, and uh, let's take a look. The drop out of the PowerPoint. This is, this is our project, but there's other ways of doing it. Uh, this is a list of 94,000 people. Um, it's um, 55,000 roughly selected because we've unchecked the people who don't have a rating, so they're excluded. And here's a list of them. And if we go to the Giving History page, and let's uh, uh, at this page, uh, we can sort of see this, this filter here has the four people in this bar who have given 25 to 50 million and on down. So here's the million dollar level, there's 87, one to two million dollar donors. I can select the target, the 151 people, and I'm going to now build a model comparing them to everybody else in this population, the roughly 55,000 who are at least rated $25,000 um, or more. And this is an okay ratio. You want this to be you know, a, at least a couple tenths of percent of the total. You want this to be at least 25 members that cleared my two hurdles. So I'm going to go down here and build a predictive model. And the goal here is there's a number of these data discovery and analysis tools that made the actual executing the model really easy. Click new model. I'm going to call it big donors. If I can type it. And this is an example of a you know, in-memory database pool with a lot of tables. Um, some of you will recognize these types of tables. The people are in the entity table. So I select a table. And I could do two kinds of models. Um, many of the tools do this. I could do a forecast of a field, uh, or I could do a, what's called a classification model, which will be looking at my target population of the 151 and comparing them to everybody else as a set. And I have a whole bunch of fields in this table. We calculated um, in another table the number of alumni committees they participated on in the last 10 years. And that's, we did a calculation table and copied it back in the memory pool. Uh, we parsed out maybe the gifts in the last uh, five to 10 years. Uh, you know, if it was all five years, it'd be a five. If it was one year, it'd be a one. Um, the last five years, numbers of reunions, sports, student activities, volunteer committees, uh, a bunch of other factors. I'm going to cut through this pretty quick, but we went to the, uh, there's a table on employment. We parsed out, was it a C-level job? That could be uh, helpful in understanding this. Going to go down, were they in a fraternity? That could be useful. Things like ID number clearly aren't helpful. Um, you know, what city were they in? What state? That's at least some proxy for wealth. We might go down, do they have a professional degree? So here there's a table on degrees that we sort of looked and saw if they had a law, medical, or uh, a business MBA. Here's some scores from a prior model. And if these are the selection, uh, the total lifetime giving. I'm going to leave those alone. So I click OK. And now I'm building 25 to 30 models behind the scene. It's multivariate regression. It's going to come back with an answer. 
so literally the interface here is you have to be able to understand a target, how to compare it to a base, think through the explanatory fields, and the model just runs. And it's telling me uh, this is a measure of did I have enough uh, metrics, and I did. Uh, it's, it's green, so that means the model believes it explained the target. Did I have enough rows, which means if I give it more information, would it adequately predict? It believes it did. It's green. And it tells me that the number of alumni committees people have participated in explains 24% of the difference between the rated prospects who gave a lot and those that didn't. And here's some lift bins. If they were in a lot, 15 to 28, they had the highest correlation. Uh, if they were in a middle group, 8 to 15, middle level, uh, 1 to 7, uh, positive. And if they've never been on a committee, negative. And then similarly, the gifts in the last 5 to 10 years, all 5 positive, everything else is a little bit negative. What city? That, that plays a role, 12%. Um, Dallas, Greenwich, Connecticut, and Stanford, Connecticut are the highest positive than some others. And then there's some down here that are negative. So this, where they live, which is a proxy for wealth, makes a difference. Um, let's go down here. Um, let's pick up some more modeling controls are hidden by the, uh, the webinar controls. Uh, C-level job. Um, yes, if they had a, have a C-level job, they're more likely. Great. I, now I understand the kinds of things that determine the difference between somebody at this high level and other people who have a rating capacity but not there. So now I want to score, so I click predict. So it's going to run that model against everybody. And I could have opened it up and said, let's run it against the non-rated people as well, because maybe some of them have these same characteristics. Let's hide some of this. So I'm going to go to a page here. Here's the model output. Let's bring everybody back. So it's saying that it scored them from a low of 0 up to a high of 0.9. Here's the ranked order. So this person got the highest score. Um, Adolf Viola, Vianel, lives in Greenwich. Um, 16 alumni committees. Uh, one volunteer committee, gifts in the last 10 years, a bunch of reunions. So this person is not a C-level job, but really engaged. And on down the list, if I go to the bottom of the list, I'm going to have a bunch of people that I can you know, just scan the right. They haven't done any of this stuff. So now let's uh, go back to my uh, the one bin here. So there's 209 people predicted to have a one. 18 are in my selection, so I'm going to get rid of my selection. And then I'm going to grab the one bin. Uh, so now I've dropped down to the new... Uh, the 191 people who were predicted to have this behavior that haven't. And I can now perform some more visual discovery. Uh, I might want to go back to the giving history page and see what their giving looks like. Overall, pretty good. Uh, going up over time, numbers of gifts going up. There's a cluster between 10 and uh, maybe $250,000 donors. So there's a bunch of people that have, you know, stepped up and started um, started uh, up the process. So let's see if we can encourage them a little further along. Where do they live? Look at them on a map uh, around the country, a bunch in the Northeast, a bunch in the Boston area. Um, got Wellesley, uh, Newton. Let's grab the Boston area because somebody's going there, I know, in a couple weeks. I'm going to sweep over the Boston area. Let's get rid of everybody else. Look at their affiliation. I'm um, trying to find patterns. There's a bunch in the 60s, you know, some in the 80s. Uh, what sports and activities? Crew. Uh, here's the college outing club, um, you know, and so forth. So I've got a down to this list. I can go back here. There's 27 of them. I can right-click, export the list out, and take action on it. Just put this on my desktop as a, you know, it's now out of here in Excel with my list of the uh, 27 that I want to take action on. So um, quick run through a model, and let's get out of Excel and back to the PowerPoint storyline. So, you know, what did we learn there? Um, we learned that modeling can be done really quickly. I just ran a model in less than 10 minutes, uh, kind of thought through, looked at it a bunch of different ways, and got a list out of it. Don't need to be a rocket scientist to do this. You can further refine it by visual analysis, like we did with where do they live? Uh, you know, are there patterns and kind of affiliation? How do I get a handle on them? Results are intuitive and action-oriented. And this is, it buys team buy-in and understanding. Um, in this case, it's very easy to understand the group, and then it leads towards new revenue opportunities. Let's look at consumer packaged goods. So this is another example, a different uh, type of problem where we're trying to understand influences on revenue. So uh, here the question is, what factors drive short-term sales? Uh, how do social media spikes relate to revenue peaks? This is a you know, key topic uh, for all brands by each brand. How does it vary by media providers? It would be like Twitter and Facebook and so forth, by type of post. 
Can we use this data to forecast sales and which factors have the most impact? So here's an example. It's basically a time series. The top line here is the revenue line uh, for all four brands. Uh, the green line are unit shipments, so the difference is price movements. Uh, this yellow line that comes up out here is uh, social media posts, which wasn't being collected before uh, this period uh, in 2010, and then it picked up and has been collected. Uh, the green line is um, calls to the call center, and the um, red line at the bottom are uh, promotional uh, promotions put on by the consumer package goods company to drive sales. And you can sort of look at this and see there's like some cyclicality based on time because this is the fourth quarter here and this is the fourth quarter here. But in general, there's a bunch of other things going on. And you could drive this down. Maybe it matters more at the week level. And like the human mind can sort of start seeing patterns in this, but it gets, gets pretty confusing. And then you need to think through as you with these time series, you know, what's the time lag? I mean, obviously, these things, uh, Twitter posts don't impact instantly. They have a, a, a day, a week, a month lag. Um, so you need to, when you're doing these models, work that through. Here we used a, a T1. Uh, you know, we're looking at the weekly level. Uh, we played around with if you take a week, what's the impact the next week? And then uh, the model runs against a table. So in this, most of these kinds of companies have a product sales table. It can come from Nielsen or wherever, and it's going to have a week date. It's going to have distribution discount efforts, uh, promotional efforts that are going on. And it's going to have you know the brands and the revenues. Um, and you clearly you want to play around some different lag factors. But there's a bunch of other data out there. So in this example, there were blog posts um, you know, which named the brands. Uh, and they're dated. So you can link them back with the product sales at Twitter, Facebook, all of this stuff. It's just out there. Then there's sentiment engines. There's a bunch of these that will take like the Twitter posts and, and classify them as positive, neutral, and negative. So this can be converted to this table, which can then be brought into the product sales. The call center, uh, there's a bunch of data down there, calls, complaints, and praise. And then there's inquiries, uh, just general inbound email inquiries, which can also be brought in. So bring all that together. And then you have to worry and, and play around with the lag a little bit. But that's not hard to do. And so then you run a model, just like we did before. And in this case, we found that the biggest influence was this is TDP as the discount, the channel discounts, has the biggest influence on short-term revenue, followed by promotional campaigns followed by social media complaints, which is 14%, followed by time. So there is cyclicality, but you know, it's dominated by these other things. We have seen some tools do very simplistic time-based forecasting. And you're missing the nuances here, which is these other things can you know, totally override the cyclicality. And some of these you can take action on. Like the, our client here watching this, if you see complaints coming, counter them with positives. Try to neutralize that impact because that impacts, you know, 14 percent impact on your revenue. And then just uh, you know, look at what happened. Uh, the the um, blue is the actual uh, revenue results. The red is our forecast off this model. We note that we didn't have the post data back in here, so it was a little less accurate. And here's the forecast out going forward. You know, we're, because we're time lagged, uh, the current data will give you the forecast out. This is an example where uh, multiple influences on revenue. You want to create the right explanatory factors. Um, and you can try time like different ways, groupings, parsing the social media into sentiment, um, examining it visually, experimenting. We did this model in a few hours. And we learned that seasonality is not the major driver of short-term revenue movement. And there are key influences out there that can be managed, like the social media uh, negative sentiments that can be countered. Inbound calls can be countered. So a lot of insight came out of this. And this is not a complicated model to do. So you know, coming back to how do you do this, uh, we could go on and show a lot of models. And we are going to in upcoming webinars following this. We'll see those in a few minutes where we're going with this. But this is. Uh, not a black box, it's a process. And it's an iterative process where you, know, you pick a target in a base population, some explanatory fields, you run, you hypothesize, you try to figure out what's likely to influence that target and make it unique. You run it, things come up that may be intuitive, may be counterintuitive, you adjust some of the explanatory factors and you run it again. And your team knows the data and the context. And this is really being enabled by these new data discovery and analysis tools, because no programming or coding is required. You saw that in the demo we just did. And you don't need a stats degree. The stats can be managed by the software. And what you just saw, we literally ran 25 to 30 models and found a best fit, and then displayed that. Now, a statistician 
would probably want to go in and untangle one versus the other. But you know, this this level of you know eight out of ten is better than two out of two. This is really helping our clients move forward. And um, this leads to the culture of analytics. And this is based on um, Gartner report, um, and we've kind of added some of our expertise into it. But I think this is pretty pervasive, and it's a change in, in a lot of businesses out there. And it's clearly becoming a differentiator to the top performers. And it becomes a sustainable competitive asset. If you can get your team, your culture, to think data-driven decisions, performance is better, and it's a weapon you can use against your competition to outperform. And there's a set of characteristics where this works or where it doesn't. Uh, one, and probably most important, is support and drive from the top. This does not work The senior management ignores the data or is in a meeting and doesn't want to see the data and is curious about the stories it's telling. There needs to second be a respect for the truth, uh, for data-driven fact-based analysis, because sometimes the truth is different than what the team is doing or thinking. We've had examples uh, in fundraising. I'll go back to that, uh, where you know the team's job has been to send 20,000 mailings out each June. And somebody with the data will come in and say, I think we could get by with 15,000 and get more revenue. And that's a hard thing if there's defensiveness or people aren't trying to respect the truth. And that particular client, they actually sent 15,000, 25% less and tripled the revenue because they targeted the messaging a lot better using the data. So, but that's a cultural thing and we often see you know, pushback and resistance. Persistence to find the root causes. This is back, you know, the inquisitive mind and the seeing the stories and you know not accepting the status quo, but continually trying to drill into it and, and ask what if, how about, uh, let's try it this way. Transparency and sharing. Uh, use analysis to guide decision making and actions, and especially driven by the top. Uh, share success stories and create heroes. Um, this is a big one. I mean, we have clients where they, they have done this beautifully and. You know, a decision gets made based on data. It might be controversial at the time, but it works. Like, cut the mailings back by 25% and triple the revenue. That person should be a hero, and the rest of the team should see the result and want to emulate it. It becomes part of the cultural stories. More agile and confident decision making, valuing and caring for information as an actual enterprise asset. This is back to collecting the data. We have clients that do all kinds of events and promotions and other things, and the data either doesn't get collected or it gets collected haphazard or it ends up strewn around on pieces of paper or spreadsheets. And it's really hard to use it in the model if that's where it is. And um, so this is part of a, again from the top, like almost a ruthless drive to make sure that all of this information that could be useful to decision making is actually captured and put somewhere in a database or some central place where you can get at it. And then it's wonderful. It can be used very easily uh, in these models. So our vision, advisor's vision, uh, we're a software company um, which also does services, is to provide products that enable business people to do analysis on their own without having to rely on experts with stats or database query skills and support that with customer enablement at efficient price points. Now this though presupposes those cultural aspects we just went through. I mean, the team for this to work, you know, the, the software industry can create great tools and that are easy to use, but then you need these cultures of analytics uh, driven from the top with transparency and, uh, you know, sort of ruthless vetting of the facts to get at the decisions uh, and, uh, you know, not stop halfway and be okay if we're going to do something controversial like cut the mailings back by 25% and understand that we're highly likely to get more revenue, and when it happens, celebrate it. So um, there's a lot of you know, business intelligence stuff going on and all these tools. Um, we are very optimistic that the tools enable these kinds of changes and that the tools with some, probably some consulting help to get you started uh, can help enable a team and, and get these cultures of analytics up and running. And, you know, back to the beginning, the, the research is showing the high performers are using data to make quicker and fact-based decisions. And it's back to that you know, 8 out of 10 is better than 2 out of 2. And this is what this enables. And just imagine, you know, you, you can make these decisions, you get 8 out of 10 of them based on data instead of just 2 out of the 10 because you only use data on 2 of them. Uh, that's the beauty of this. 
So we've uh, cleared our half hour here, um, and we're open for questions. Um, you can, uh, there's a chat box, um, you can type things on the right, you can put your hand up and we can unmute you if you're brave. Um, you can always contact us afterwards uh, and we'll get back to you. Uh, and as we go to the Q&A, I just want to say, you know, this is the first in a sequence. We're going to follow this up in November uh, with a webinar on predictive modeling and fundraising, uh, where we're going to take that as a theme and we did a little bit here but go down deeper. Then we're going to go to higher education, which is you know, student side uh, success, recruitment, that kind of stuff in early December. And then after the holidays, we're going to come back and look at work we're doing in healthcare and then manufacturing, uh, where there's you know, some really cool things happening. So, um, whoops, I didn't mean to end it. <laughs> uh, time for a QA. and um, a So uh, we'll take questions. We're trying to predict people. Here's a question. Uh, yeah, what, what kind of analysis is this regression or factor analysis using? Um, yeah, so the model I ran was a multivariant linear regression model. Um, it's basically a very close fitting modeling approach that uh, is basically, you know, rips through all those explanatory factors and, and tries binning them in different ways and then does a close fit and then, you know, it creates a mathematical equation that um, we sh saw the output from, but that can also be saved and, and reused uh, when you, um, if you score off it, it can be you know, saved and reused, to, so when you load more data, it can score again. Um, we, are we trying to predict rich people or predict rich people who will make a million dollar gift? Yeah, we're, well, it's on that one example, uh, we're trying to understand the set of characteristics that lead to people making a million dollar gift. So. You know, one of the factors is wealth. Um, there was actually were rating scores I didn't bring into that model, but we use city, and we saw that Greenwich and Stanford, Connecticut, some of the high net worth towns came up high. So that's a proxy for wealth. But that was weighted below, um, and we actually had a rating level, so we dropped the people who presumably have no wealth out of that model when we built it. Uh, so the differentiating factors were a lot about engagement or attachment, um, because it's wealth a purchase or, or a donation or anything on that side is basically uh, there's a set of factors that have to come together for a high likelihood of someone uh, actually you know, triggering it and making a gift. How do we know if the parameters are statistically significant in the model? Um, the lift buckets of which the explanatory factors are more or less significant. Yeah, so there's, when I ran that model I kind of went through it pretty quick, but there are um, so in our modeling, uh, we've hidden a lot of the behind-the-scenes modeling scores. We have a new release coming up at the end of the year where we'll have an optional, like a more of an expert mode where you can expose them. But those lift buckets, uh, if you, when you those bars, uh, there are brush-ups under, under, on, uh, that would pop up, which get, actually give you the lift characteristics and the, um, uh, the strength of fit. And then there's actually the model also wrote into the data. We looked at just the bin to 1-0 prediction, the score from low to high. It also puts a strength of fit against each each member, uh, so uh, you could you know, bring that up as well. And if you're got a set of people who scored high, but the the model of strength of fit is low, you might question them. Uh, so it's got all of that in it. We just went kind of through it pretty quick. Um, can you explain dependent versus independent? Yeah, great question. That's back to the explanatory field. So uh, the best example of a dependent variable would be. Uh, if I, uh, as I did, I selected like large donors, and maybe uh, a factor would be, you know, total contributions to the annual fund. Well, that's highly related to the very uh, collinear with the selection of the target, so it would not be an independent factor. It's, it's, it's they're related. Um, or maybe I, I don't know, I grabbed, you know, um, a group that um, has participated. You know, well, we actually had one of these where we had a an interest survey that had come in, and we were looking at um, propensity to donate to a financial aid matching grant. And one of the factors that came out really strong is that they expressed interest in a survey for scholarship and financial aid. Uh, it turns out one of the people in the room said that's actually not independent. And they use that word because the field officers had adjusted the survey response that these people had given a lot to financial aid. So this thing that looked independent was actually the same thing, uh, and, and therefore the model is going to figure out 
it's the same thing and it's, it's and not, not particularly useful. So that would be good examples of independent uh, versus dependent. Was the data loaded for the higher education model uh, individual records? Yeah, the, a lot of questions in the higher education model. We have a you know good group from that industry on the webinar. Uh, the data there, we basically what we're loading is um, the source system table. So typically, when we work with a client, we're loading you know the advanced tables, Millennium, Razor's Edge, uh, Banner, whatever the source system is. We're typically loading. 15 to 150 tables, depending on what shape they're in. So in that model, let me go back to it. Um, there were, when I went in here to run the model, I uh, closed down the model view. Let me just open it up again. Uh, pretty good model. When I went to build the model, there were a set of tables. So we're, you know, this is a disguise advanced data. I, you know, affiliation, children, cities degrees, employment, uh, the entity table, gifts, giving, honors. And so there's a set of these tables. This is actually a subset of what we typically load. But we're loading a lot of data in. And then in our memory mart, uh, we can calculate out uh, these other calculations, like numbers of alumni committees and numbers of uh, sports and some of the giving buckets. Uh, we calculate out of the raw data we load in. So the cool thing about this is a lot of the data prep um, that you need to do to get a model to run, uh, which is hard to do if somebody's got to edit the database tables. We can sweep the tables in, and these things are like, you know, 20-minute exercises in here to take the uh, alumni committees table and, and figure out how many committees everybody's been in or how many of what kind of committees everybody's been in or how many, you know, gifts uh, they've made, how many of the last five years they've made a gift. So uh, in our world, uh, yeah, we're loading in basically tables from whatever the source systems are. And I, I can take that on. And in manufacturing, we're, we have a project right now where we're loading. Uh, there's five uh, production machine systems. And we're loading the log files from those five machines in, as well as the commercial uh, SQL server tables for revenue and customers and orders and all of that. And then we're merging it together for the modeling. Because there's a bunch of stuff that's in that machine data that's useful for the modeling. And you know that client, if you had to like create a data warehouse and merge all that for modeling, it would be a huge project. In our world, we're, you know, we're this like, my picture at the back here, which I went over quickly. Uh, we're an analytic sandbox. Um, we're this thing right here, where you can bring this data in, quickly uh, you know, bring it together, muck around in it, create these factors, play around with the model, and um, you know, get results. Uh, it's not a lot of. Uh, big data prep that you have to do in some uh, a data warehouse is not made it's not designed to do this quick agile analytics so that's what these new and memory based discovery tools uh, which we are one of them are meant to do and it's what our strength is um, long answer to a good question what application was used to generate the analysis yeah we uh, we're trying to keep this tutorial, but we, we use our software. It's uh, Advisor Solutions. Uh, and we're uh, one of the leading data discovery and analysis software companies, and we've probably done more than our friends out there to create an analytics-centric experience. And you know, we'd say we're our theme is we're more visual than Excel, we're more analytical than Tableau, and we're more predictive than both. So it's sort of some of those skill sets, only we've kind of taken it more towards uh, analysis like this. Can you provide suggestions for delivering communicating results post predictive modeling? Yeah, great example. Uh, that's an actually, actually an awesome uh, uh, example. A uh, question. Um, I'm going to open something else. I'm going to go to my desktop, and uh, this is this is actually more like a project we would deliver to a client. So I'm going to open it on my desktop, and um, because you don't want to show management modeling scores, if anything will turn them off, <laughs> that will. Uh, so we usually try to bin them and put user-friendly handles on it. And I want to take that same you know, higher education one and uh, sort of take it up a level. So we've already done the modeling. We've created the scores. And now this is something we're going to you know, push out. And it's going to come up here. Uh, this is a bunch of pages and text description. But this ratings page, um, here's the capacity ratings. We were working with these and the other ones where we filtered out the unrated, which is what we have here, and different ratings. And then these attachment scores, these are modeling outputs. So we have taken the scores here and grouped them into owners, highly engaged, engaged, detached, and disconnected. 
Uh, and the coloring here is the rating. So the red is the high rated. As you can actually see in the attachment scores, there's some like really high rated who are disconnected. And um, there's uh, some lower ratings who are owners. If I look at these, let's click the owners and go to a page over here. Um, the highest score from the models is 2375. It's this guy, uh, Rose Stevenson. Uh, he's an owner. Uh, he got binned into that. And it's because he's been to 10 volunteer committees, made gifts in each of the last five years, gifts five years before, been to seven reunions, two sports. If I went back here and uh, grabbed the, uh, this, maybe I want to find who are the high rated, 1 million plus, grab them and find the ones that are disconnected because I'm like, concerned about them. Uh, so I've got really high rated people who are disconnected. Well, they got really low scores. Uh, the modeling algorithm, 177 on down. I can see what's going on. One volunteer committee, no gifts two sports, you know, kind of went to school, a bunch of activities and left. You know, I kind of got, here's another one. Uh, you know, they played some sports, but then they bolted. So, um, and they've given something at some point in time. So this is the kind of thing where we've got the detail because somebody at some level needs to understand why they're low and what can I do to get them higher. If I want to get them higher, I'd get them on a committee and probably get them to a reunion or something. Uh, but, you know, at this level, you can't navigate the scores and most people don't understand them. So um, we feel really strongly that if you do modeling, you need to get the output, if you're going to be used by a group, into some really simple handle like this. And we like kind of five bins, and we like putting really user-friendly labels on them so people know what they are. But don't not show the scores, because at some point, that detail actually does matter, because you need to know why they're low, or why they're high, or what I can do to get them higher. Yeah, you know, you can. Um, another question came in, can you export the results? Um, yeah, well, we saw a little bit of that earlier where I can you know, take the list and export them out to Excel. You want to get these charts out of here, too. I mean, you can, if you want to take this page, which is a picture of my, uh, my score profile, I can go over here to the task view and uh, let's get this page, export the page out of here because I want to give this to somebody. I'm going to add this uh, page on ratings. And I'm going to click OK, and I'm going to put in a PowerPoint, uh, put on my desktop. So in addition to getting the data out, like we did before, to create um, a list for somebody to take action on, uh, this is going to take this page and dump it into a PowerPoint, where I can say, you know, here's my ratings, and here's this list, and these are just chart objects. I can edit the page and text or whatever. But yeah, that was a good follow-on question that, you know, you get these numeric scores, and you want to be able to use them really easily and also get them out of here to do something and communicate them well. Does your product consider interaction, interaction variables or variable transformations of square roots? Uh, totally. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more into detail, I guess. Uh, we're getting a little more technical question. If I go back over here to the task view, and there's something called here a project workshop. So the question was, can I transform to square roots exponential transformations? The modeling algorithms actually do that um, automatically. But we have in a project, you know, uh, this thing's loaded 18 tables. It rolled up eight more. So like I know one of them was a giving table. We, we summed it up to figure out maximum gift and biggest and total giving. And then there's a bunch of calculations. So on the calculation side, um, the whole, the whole list of them. I have a whole bunch of capabilities in here to you know, do a bunch of operations, uh, arithmetic, uh, logical, comparison, uh, set membership functions, conversion, math. So yeah, I can, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can see in there I can do. I can do uh, string manipulation so I can parse things out. This is how we can take the data. There's a bunch of date calculations that I can do. Um, I can parse dates into years and months and whatnot. And there's some constants in here I can work with. So this is how, in this case, we've loaded, looks like uh, um, we've loaded uh, 18 tables, created eight more, did a bunch of calculations. And we can uh, do transforms, uh, parse things out of strings, which is often critical. You've got like event names. And we've seen cases where there's 6,000 events and there's no grouping for them. But the names at least have some coding. Like we had a, a, a large microfinance bank where they had events in Af about Africa and Central America and South America. You could parse out on the names and get them into groupings. And there are different themes as well. So yeah, that's how in our analytical sandbox we can bring in all these tables and somebody can 
muck around in them uh, and explore and just play with these different groupings, factors, put them through models really easily without having uh, you know a bunch of database work done. Good questions. Can your software predict based on past values? Can it predict? Uh, yeah, I think we actually saw that in um, the time series example we went through uh, was a pretty good run through of that one where, um, just to bring you back, questions can it predict? The answer is yeah, if I just go back to this one. Um, this is this whole, it's not a time series. Um, it, 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 it's data that runs over time, but the time, the period of time is a 7% influence uh, on sales. It's the, uh, the other factors, which is the channel discounts, the promotional efforts, the post-social media complaints uh, are higher than time, and then all these other things add up. And it's an example of a forecast where I think we're lagging a few weeks. So um, here's the, uh, the actual incremental sales revenue. It, it hasn't happened yet, but we can forecast it out based on the uh, sets of things going on in this period. So yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, these models can easily forecast. And you know, if it was just a time sequence, we could forecast way out. But you know, these things uh, have like lag times of one, two, three weeks. They don't have a lot of persistence, many of them. So that's why, in this case, we're not we're only going out a few weeks. How is this different than Rapid Insight? Um, good question. Um, I will be. What I would say here is, uh, the two companies we 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 really respect Rapid Insight. Uh, they are a great company. Uh, we're actually very close with them, and we're doing a bunch of work together. Um, so I would give them the highest compliments, and I um, will say more uh, later on in the quarter. But for now, I'd say, you know, we we include algorithms, uh, and we're actually using another companies now, and we're you know strongly interested in what they're doing, and would encourage you to consider their uh, their mining algorithms. I'd say what we do is you know we're not just a predictive modeling tool; we're a data discovery app with this in-memory pool and interactive visualization. So we do modeling. We also push results out to large groups of people. So like that project I just showed, with the, uh, the, you know, the bar charts and whatever, that can be pushed out over the web to a whole team of people, 50 people, 100 people, who can then you know, kind of consume it and use it. So we're, uh, we are more of a whole you know, front end, uh, Data discovery analysis visualization tool that also uses predictive modeling. Uh, you know, they are a predictive modeling company that does a great job, and we have high respect for them. Could you show an example of creating a cross table link? Ah, <laughs> okay, a cross table link. I hope people know what that is. So here's an example of one. I'm going to open up my project again. Uh, there's a bunch of cross table links in here. Uh, selection links. Let's see if I click this. Um, so when I click on something in one of those bars in, in the project, visually, a whole bunch of stuff updated. You saw that when I uh, selected my model outputs and the map reduced, and I selected on the map, and then the list changed. Well, in here, we're keying the tables together. So like the affiliation table is linked on ID number to the entity table. So if I, have, if I click like parents, um, it lights up all the parents, and then it'll actually refresh, and so that some of those parents are also alumni and you know grandparents and whatever. And the same thing with like gifts. Um, I don't know if it's, well, it was subtle, but when I selected the people who had been million dollar donors, the the giving line charts all changed because the gift table is key to the entity table, and those people's gifts then showed up. Just for example, if I want to grab um, I don't know Gary Allen, this is on the entity table. I click Gary. This is the gift transactions for Gary Allen. Um, you know, uh, one person, and here's the giving detail, uh, the gifts table for Gary Allen. It's going to be his history of gifts over the 20, 30 year period. Uh, from it's, it's dated data right now, but you can sort of see it all. And this is all Gary Allen. So that's um, how we key these things together. Um, we also copy things. So this is saying that in the number of sports table, we must have rolled something up on ID number to the entity table. And we copied over some fields. If I want to see what I copied over, I can click this. Uh, looks like I copied over the number of sports. So it looks like what we did is we created this number of sports table out of some participation table 
uh, by rolling it up to sum the number of sports everybody played and copied it over. Um, there's probably a roll-up in here on that. Uh, here's sports was uh, rolled up into number of sports. So there's a bunch of the cross-table links uh, kind of drove me down into detail here, but um, you know, this is an example of uh, a lot of the things we can do uh, when we get the data in uh, from wherever it comes from. How do you determine the sample size needed for explanatory fields? Is that factored in the robustness score? Uh, yeah, that's actually a great question. Um, yes, it's factored in the robustness score. And generally, you know, when you're building the model, uh, these so the algorithms we use, with this, there's a bunch of things underneath this. The target, you know, needs to have at least 25 entities in it. Uh, any target smaller than that, I think every stats book would say it's not statistically valid. Uh, you want you want the uh, uh, the, the, the different uh, systematic risk to be eliminated. So uh, you need to get over 25, and then you need a ratio of the target to the base, which is why we took out the uh, unrated prospects because that the, that needs to be you know, ratioed at at least a few tenths of a percent or it's going to be um, swamped and the model will come out with low coefficients. And then um, you've got the explanatory fields. You know, you have to think through, the model will handle if a lot of them are missing. Um, so like if you have an employment table and uh, you have 100,000 people and have employment on 1,000 people, but they actually all have employment. You have to watch that. The model will deal with the missings, but um, logically, you are. Um, it's not. It's not a good factor to put in because many people have it, but you only have it on a few. And the reason you only have it on a few is because you didn't collect it. Not that they don't have it. The same thing if you do event attendance, and you know, if you have event attendance on just a few people, but there's a whole bunch of people who've been to events. You're under waiting uh, those people for whom you just never collected the event attendance data. So there's another set of things going on there where when you're building a model, you have to think through, is this actually representative of my, this explanatory field, is the content representative of what actually happened? And that's back to even understanding factors like that example I gave a few minutes ago with the uh, survey, where it looked like it was an independent, an independent survey but the results have been updated based on actual performance. So no longer an independent input, it's, it's updated based on performance. Well, that's content that really uh, is then no longer independent. So a lot of that, that's why we go back and say this really ought to be done with two or three people you know, in a room strategizing together because these are the keys that make the model really good or not very good. That was actually a really good question. Uh, how is a data model created in this tool? Please could you show the data model you're using in the current example? Does the model need to be a star scheme or could it have loops? You kind of hit that uh, sort of a rich question. You know, our data model, let me open a project again, uh, is um, probably best represented by these selection links. Uh, uh, our data model is bringing relational tables into um, RAM, so they're running in memory either on a web server or I'm running on a PC here. And then we affiliate them on keys. Uh, it looks like in this case we're keying off the ID number all the time. It doesn't have to be. Um, it can be a star schema. There can be loops. You just want to make sure they're one-way loops and not looping. Like You, you want to make sure the loops aren't going to... We'll, we will not allow an infinite loop or, or a loop that's going to cause a, a problem. So we will, the software will figure out you know, looping complete circle loops. But you can link table to table to table. Uh, you can key off different things. Like I, I know we just did a project where we brought in zip codes from Forbes because there wasn't any wealth screening. And we just we were able to parse the zip codes down to five-digit zips and just copy them over on the zip code, uh, not the ID. So there's a lot we could do in here. And let me just go back to the tables. I mean, this is sort of this project is a fairly small project. Uh, the 26 total tables got 4 million rows. And kind of, you can sort of see what the some of the bigger ones are the gifts table. Uh, interest is a big one because people are in multiple interests and so forth. So this, you know, you look at our manufacturing data or our healthcare data or work we do in retail, it's similar to this. I mean, you have a bunch of machine data in here. Um, it's linking back. There's usually customer IDs or some kind of an ID keying that we can uh, copy or link uh, the table together. And we have our, so our data model to summarize 
is an in-memory store of relational data. Um, we have a columnar uh, uh, search approach, a keying, uh, which is how all the interaction happens. And then the tables are, are linked for all of this. How does Advisor work with the client's database? Is it a one-time upload or a single import for each model? Um, OK, good question. Um, this project I'm working in, so we create projects. Picture this like an Excel file. I can save the project two ways, uh, as an ADV or as an ADVM. Uh, the ADV uh, saves the scheme of the project, which is the data load and all the calculations and the charts. And if you open it, it goes back to the source systems, SQL Server, Oracle, uh, Postgres, uh, Excel, whatever we are loading from, and reloads it. Um, if it's an ADVM, it compresses and embeds the snapshot of data it has uh, and will reopen with that in it. And somebody in ad hoc mode, like I've been, is probably going to work with the ADV because they want to refresh and reload. If you then put this in production out to a team, you would normally set up a script. Uh, it can load daily, twice a day, five times a day, whatever. Usually it's daily. And so at 3 in the morning, say, the script kicks off an ADV project, which goes, goes and loads and refreshes the SQL Server tables, access Excel, everything and then converts it to an ADVM project, which then puts somewhere which then the client users use, or if you come in off the web, the web version, uh, if they come in off a web version, it'll do the same thing and open that project up uh, in a browser. There's a server with a bunch of projects. So I'm going to grab that same project here. Um, so this is just unpacking a preloaded project. It's not going to the database. It comes up and it serves up in the browser. And our, you know, by doing that, we got to, you know, tend to 20 second start time in most of these things and then sub second interaction. So we go into production that way. We save the issue that's the middle of the day, the database write times are slow, the network's jammed, so it takes a long time. You know, we want people to be up and running in you know, 10, 20, maybe 30 seconds. How does is this uh, is information indicator like a p-value? Uh, the information indicator, uh, go back over here. So this is like an R squared. Um, right now we're using algorithms from a SAP company called KXCN, and it's their version of an R squared. Um, and there's actually technical information on this up on our website, uh, www.advisorsolutions.com. The home page is, is a thing in the middle on predictive analytics. It's a, it's a white paper on what's actually in this and the algorithms. As I said, we are looking at options. And I, I mentioned a company we like a lot earlier. And uh, you know, uh, I'll say no more at this point. Is the solution embeddable? Uh, great question. Uh, we have, we have. So this is, would be for another software company generally trying to embed this. Uh, we have some. Uh, we have a number of OEMs, um, in different industries, uh, security and intrusion, uh, general BI, healthcare claims, uh, higher education. Um, we have an older version where you can actually embed these charts. Uh, these charts are all object controls, and they can be embedded in another application. Um, what we're doing more today is not embedding them, but linking them um, for data. So for example, one of our OEMs, um, the task view is uh, known, uh, would be information builders. And if I was to load data, our wizard has um, a web focus procedures in here. So if I click through this, it's going to and ask me for a bunch of you know I, I information builders log on and credentials and this is going to go execute security through their web focus and then do a draw of whatever data I'm requesting back and then um, on the return we can do selection I exported to Excel with their systems I can click and, and it'll open up a web focus report in a browser you know right out of my selection so it'll send it back to web focus and pop back a specific report so we've kind of moved from embedding the charts um, in I'll get out of all this. Got too much open here. Uh, embedding the charts in an app as, as, as separate controls to, you know, uh, having this uh, adjunct application that's pulling data out, doing something with it, and sending it back. Um, and a number of our OEMs is how we're working that. Um, yeah. So we're right at the half hour webinar, half hour Q and A. I would. Any last questions coming through? Um, I would say uh, we will have this recorded and out within the week, and um, 
we are uh, going to launch uh, the sequences to this, uh, the sequels to this, over the next couple of weeks. So keep your eyes open. This is a topic. Uh, just in close, we've got a lot of experience in, and you know we love talking about it. And we really do believe that you know business groups who don't have stat skills and don't know a lot about database query can actually do this, and we believe it better because, as we've said throughout this, they know the context of their business. They know what's actually in the data uh, from the content perspective, and they can you know, get to the point of 8 out of 10 and be better than 2 out of 2, and that, that's what we're all about. So if you want to continue that discussion, uh, you know how to reach us. Uh, my, my email and phone here, uh, you can come to our website at www.advisorsolutions.com. Uh, thanks for the time. Appreciate it.